थे Start over. What? Start over. Okay. Hello, my name is James Nelson, and this is the Las Vegas ISA chapter a presentation on taking Ethernet IP to the plant floor. Uh, this presentation is going to uh, define Ethernet IP in relative detail, demonstrate some of the Ethernet IP technologies uh, in our simulated plant floor that we have. Demonstrate uh, some of your network troubleshooting resources that you can have, and uh, we'll try and give uh, the, the, the audience some good references for material that they can take and use for their own uh, their own network, and what um, takeaways that they can take from the presentation uh, to help them out with making a decision about Ethernet IP or implementing Ethernet IP. And finally, um, we're going to put a, a, a list of the acronyms that we use in the presentation uh, for everyone's reference, because a lot of the time uh, when you're dealing with uh, networking and IT individuals, uh, you see a lot of these acronyms come up, and if you're not familiar with them, they can be a little confusing, so hopefully we'll arm, arm our uh, uh, viewers uh, with some uh, knowledge so that they can feel comfortable in those conversations. To start out, we'll do a little bit of the history of Ethernet IP. Uh, Ethernet IP was developed in the 1990s and introduced in 2001 by Rockwell Automation. Um, in 2008, uh, uh, Schneider Electric uh, made the decision to introduce a uh, Modbus TCP and Ethernet uh, IP uh, uh, compatible communications module with their quantum systems and to join with the Open Device Set Vendor Association, the ODDA, um, hopefully to uh, try to move forward with a single industrial Ethernet standard uh, for this type of technology. The ODDA uh, right now is the champion for Ethernet IP and is trying to move that standard forward and make it uh, readily accessible to different vendors. And the current members of uh, the current larger members of the ODDA are Rockwell Automation, Schneider Electric, Cisco, Eaton, Andrews Hauser, and Online. Um, back in uh, 2007, uh, there was an estimated that Ethernet IP would constitute approximately 40% of the market in the industrial Ethernet uh, inst installation. And uh, back in 2007, there were already over a million installed nodes of Ethernet IP. Uh, and that has only gone up since then. Uh, what we would like to do is to give you uh, basically uh, what is Ethernet IP in a nutshell. Um, and then go into more detail uh, on different points that we make here in this presentation. Um, Ethernet IP is simply the application layer protocol uh, uh, that is transferred inside of, a, inside of a TCP IP packet. What that means is, is the software encapsulates the data, formats it, and then sends it out over the network to make sure that it gets to the desired end user. Um, it is not the network, but it is how the network communicates. Um, Ethernet IP is based on the common industrial protocol, the CIP, uh, which is um, um, was developed by or is used by Rockwell Automation and uh, is very common uh, with the Rockwell products and is also the basis for device net and control net but they just use different media to transfer the information. Um, when we talk about Ethernet IP devices, there's two kinds of devices that we can talk about. Um, there are uh, scanners, which are the devices that you may consider to be the uh, keeper or master, and they are the devices that initiate and control the communication. And then there are adapters, which you can considered to be slave devices or, or end nodes, and they provide the data to the scanners. Um, there's also two different types of messaging that exists between the two. There is explicit messaging, which is asyn asynchronous messaging, uh, triggered messaging, uh, either off of a timer or an event that initiates a connection between the scanner and the adapter, and um, then retrieves data and brings it back or implicit or IO messaging that is a continuous connection where the, uh, the uh, 
scanner opens a, a permanent connection with the adapter, and the data transfer is, is continuous between the two devices. Other important pieces of information about Ethernet IP is, is that Ethernet IP, the specification for Ethernet IP, uh, requires that the vendors encapsulate their data in objects. Uh, these objects then contain the individual values of the device and attributes, and that the two sets of, or excuse me, in the device there are two sets of objects. There's a set of required objects that by specification must exist, and then a set of uh, application objects that hold all of the process data that um, the device has. So this is really the, the, the piece of, of the, these objects that are piece of part of this device are the ones that identify it on the network, that identify itself, that allow for the communication, the um, IP address, all of that's in the required objects. And then the application objects where all the process data that is unique to that device exists. So let's take a second and just kind of talk about what's the difference between Ethernet IP and Ethernet or industrial Ethernet or, or in general just to kind of define our terms so we can understand that. The Ethernet is the hardware. It's the switches, the routers, the, the hubs, the patch panels, and the media, the fiber, the CAT6 cables, the CAT5 cables, all of that um, along with the transport controls and uh, devices and the switches and routers, all of that meets up with the IEEE 802 standards and is the Ethernet. It's the same Ethernet that you see in your office or, or at your home or, or wherever. The IP part of this is the industrial protocol, not the internet protocol, which is a, a, maybe a little bit of a, a confusing point, but it's Ethernet industrial protocol. Ethernet industrial protocol lives in the application layer of the OSI reference model, and we'll talk about that in a second. It's governed, once again, by the ODDA, and it uses the CIP standard. The OSI, uh, the OSI model, uh, which stands for Open System Interconnection Model, uh, basically defines these seven layers of, the, of, of how a, a, an Ethernet message is communicated from software, hardware, and then to software again. This part of the stack or the model is considered to be the Ethernet part of the equation, and this piece right here is considered to be the CIP part of the equation. So Ethernet IP lives mostly up in here when it comes to talking about the network. And that's just strictly how the data is formatted and how it's communicated. Um, the CIP portion, which it's based on, basically just lives up in these three layers up here. And we'll talk about that in a second. So if, if you can see this, this is the CIP. This is how the CIP transfers its data. And then the CIP is then put on this part of the Ethernet to make up Ethernet IP. So we'll talk about the other important piece of the equation, uh, which is implicit and explicit messaging. And we should probably take a break here. Let's take a stop. Let's make a stop here. I'm just going to record you saying that now. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, in the next section, in the next presentation, we're going to be discussing the implicit and explicit messaging and the Ethernet objects and the different attributes and the way we use those in implicit and explicit messaging. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, this is the second uh, part of the presentation on Ethernet IP uh, for the Las Vegas ISA section. And this section of the uh, presentation will go over implicit versus explicit messaging and the uh, object devices and their configuration. So, um, first off, what we'd like to talk about is implicit versus explicit uh, communication and messaging. Uh, first of all, 
first off, we have implicit messaging. And it uses the user datagram protocol, or the UDP. And it is a constant communication. It is a constant connection between the Ethernet IP adapters and scanner. Um, one, one form of this, the most common form of this you probably see, is like a remote I.O. connection. Or for the Rockwell products, the producing consume tags. And in this case, uh, on, and we'll, as we'll show it, as we'll demonstrate in the uh, uh, factory uh, plant floor demonstration, you'll see how a scanner can own an adapter because the adapter will be looking for a first hold response master uh, in order for it to communicate. With explicit communication, it is a pulled or requested communication that basically uh, the most familiar form would be uh, just a, a read or a write message uh, in PLCs. Um, it requires a path and a definition of the object structure, the instances, and the attributes of the object. And in this case, the adapter isn't home. Uh, the uh, um, scanner would go out and um, uh, open a connection, uh, take the message that it needs, and then close the connection. And it is based on a more of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, methodology. So the way to think of it is implicit is, is, is a pipe that is permanently connected between the two devices. And an explicit message is like a softball thrown between the two, the two devices with information. Uh, we'll show here, just, just once again, showing the uh, different uh, layers of the Ethernet. And we show that the explicit is, is over in here, and the implicit is over in here, and how the CIP and the Ethernet all work together to move this part, move this, move these two pieces of move the data across the network. And then we'll talk about the next important piece of information that people uh, should understand about Ethernet IP is how the devices encapsulate their data. And they encapsulate their data in objects. And objects can have a class code or an assembly instance or or uh, uh, they have a, a unique identity. For each, ob for each type of object um, that uh, is defined by the manufacturer and defined by the specification. The required objects are defined by the Ethernet IP specifications and consists of uh, a set of, of, of simple objects that tell the device on the network who it is and uh, who, it's, who it needs to uh, uh, communicate with. The application objects are the unique objects provided by the manufacturers that will allow um, process data to be read or written to um, in, the, in the individual pieces of, of uh, uh, hardware that exist out in the, out in the real world. Um, the attributes are values within the objects. Um, so for example, in the identity object, they may have a vendor ID and a device type, IP addresses, that, that sort of stuff. Um, and then also, with these objects, you can have instances of types of objects. So you may have a, a application object that has a certain type of data and certain attributes, and that, that template or that object can be replicated with different data values, but the same structure and the same, um, same way that the information is organized. So let's talk about this for just a uh, kind of a more of a graphical interface. We have our Ethernet network that exists. Our device is connected to the Ethernet network. And then Ethernet IP sets up a set of required objects with a class code. And inside of that, those objects are attributes that help define it and put it on the network for communication. And then inside of it, we have application objects and these application objects also have attributes. And those attributes are usually where your process data that is important to you really lives. And once again, you can have different instances of that process data. Uh, one thing that uh, we want to touch on that's um, kind of always been an issue with the Ethernet and industrial Ethernet protocols in general is determinism. Um, Ethernet IP is not a deterministic network. And by that we mean we need to know how long 
A deterministic network is, is a repeatable network that tells you how long it takes for a message to get there and how long it takes for the response to come back. Um, the Ethernet IP is not a truly deterministic network because you can't guarantee how long it takes to go through the network. Um, if a, a switch goes down and the router has to reroute it, that can add certain latency to it that is not controlled and uh, easily predicted. Now, that, that being said, the reason that, uh, that Ethernet IP is not deterministic is because it, it is designed to work with commercial off-the-shelf technology. Okay? Uh, most anyone's routers, most anyone's switches, uh, you can use that as part of the Ethernet network, and Ethernet IP will work with it. Um, that kind of gives you some advantages, but then it has some disadvantages. So the overall deterministic behavior of Ethernet IP is usually set up between the application and the network. So since we can't control our network perfectly, we can't guarantee a certain, a certain latency or a certain time that it takes for the message to get across. However, if you want to increase your, your reliability of the communication, you follow some of the best networking practices out there, like designing your network to be a, a, a ring configuration, uh, using quality of service, segmenting your network into virtual uh, local area networks, VLANs, using IGMP snooping, and uh, controlling your multicast messaging. Multicast messaging is one of the uh, main hindrances to uh, Ethernet communications in general. And uh, if that, uh, if a device begins to uh, multicast too much, it can cause problems with the network in general. So we want to do a good design of our network. Uh, and this will help reduce our multicast uh, vulnerability and also improve our determinism as well. So that's really one of the keys to when you define, uh, design the network. Okay, um, I think we're gonna stop this presentation here real quick, uh, and then we're gonna move over to the next uh, part of the presentation, which is the demonstration of our devices on the Ethernet IP network. And uh, um, then we'll follow up with some of the other pieces of the presentation, and finally we're gonna end with uh, what we want to do is what take what takeaways you can take from this presentation and use on the plan. Give them credit. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, this is the uh, third part of the ISA the Las Vegas section uh, presentation on Ethernet IP, uh, taking Ethernet IP to the plant floor. Uh, in this section, we're going to go over a demonstration of the uh, different devices that are all interconnected with Ethernet IP. Uh, this is a pretty simple demonstration, just showing the, um, uh, reiterating the points that we've made earlier in the um, presentation. And we will start out by explaining what we have. Basically, uh, if you come over here and you look uh, at, at our, at our uh, setup, we have uh, modeled two different uh, processes. Uh, one process is based on the Schneider Electric Monocon Quantum with a Telemachine Altair 61 uh, using uh, personal switches and, and uh, uh, Ethernet IP using a, a NOC 77101 Ethernet IP card uh, connected to uh, some other personal switches which represent our network backbone uh, and uh, our SCADA computer is uh, plugged into that network backbone. And then over here we have a Rockwell plant, um, which has a Stratic switch, a PowerFlex 70 drive, and a ControlLogix uh, PLC. Obviously communicating over the evening. Um, in our little demonstration that we have here, what we're trying to show is is that we have we pre-built this, this screen to show uh, uh, the primary controller. So in this case, we have the Altair drive. And it is being primarily controlled by the quantum PLC, but we'll show how it can be controlled by the control logics PLC. And then over here with the PowerFlex, we have uh, the PowerFlex uh, drive being controlled by the control logics, and then we'll show how it can be controlled by the quantum. And then we'll explain how we set those up inside of the PLC 
and give a demonstration of explicit messaging. So first off, let's just go ahead and start these uh, very simply. Uh, we've started this one from the control logics. Then we're going to start the Altair drive from the quantum. Now then, what we're going to do is start out by disconnecting the Schneider drive from the network. Now when we do that, Since we've already pre-configured the control logics to see the alt pair, um, the control logic should now be uh, we go through the network and still connected to the to the alt pair. Um, the control logic should now be the scanner that's on the alt pairs. The, the adapter for the control logic will now be the first pulled first pulled response master. And now it owns the uh, Altair drive. So we'll come down here, and then we're back on our plant number one side of, of the uh, of the SCADA. We see that we have a bad condition. Uh, we're not communicating via the quantum. Uh, the SCADA is not communicating, and. <coughs> We'll come back here to our control logics, and we'll start up the drive using the control logics configuration. And we can adjust the frequency. And we have control of the system. Now, one of the other things that we can talk about when we use industrial Ethernet uh, a protocol, or we use Ethernet IP in particular, uh, even though this isn't Ethernet IP, this is more Ethernet, we can uh, uh, connect to our Ethernet devices uh, using a browser by typing in the IP address and by opening up the browser in SCADA, we can connect to the devices and it opens up a lot of the information that is specific to the device on your SCADA system. So normally you would have uh, either hardware control or you'd have via the implicit messaging, you've got control of the device. But you know sometimes you're not going to you sometimes you're not always going to care about a uh, certain information. But if you have a, a browser you can go to that website and you can drill in and find out that information directly from the drive without mapping it through your VLC. So we will stop the uh, Altair via the control logic. And we've stopped, the, we've stopped that. So we will resume communicating with the quantum PLC. And now we will unplug. The Rockwell PLC. So now we we'll wait for the network to catch up. And what we should be able to do is now control the power flex via the Schneider. Now that the Rockwell is disconnected, and control the Altair with the Schneider. Now that the Rockwell is disconnected, um, it sounds like a, a, a good. Um, uh, maybe uh, some interesting um, methodology and, and abilities. However, it's still not very practical because you're still not going to give up that ownership of the adapter without messing, without um, disconnecting devices from the network. So this is more of a demonstration, not a, a capability that you would want to use, but just a demonstration of, of how that they can be connected and configured to work with each other. So now, we 
come back here and we're on the power flex and we see that the Schneider is now communicating with it and the control logic is not. So the first thing we'll do is we will reset the fault on the power flex 70. And this is for the two different drives. It's configurable whether it faults on the loss of network or not. In this case, it doesn't fault on the alt pair, but it does fault on the control logic. And that's all we're just demonstrating is that. And so now we're going to start the power flex with the quantum plugged in and the RS logics unplugged. And then we'll go back to the plant one PLC or data screen. It shows that we've got good data from the quantum to the altimeter. And we're able to control it via the quantum. So let's take a look. First off, inside of the quantum PLC program, how do we configure these two drives to communicate with the respective controllers? For the quantum, you start out by going to the Ethernet IP adapter, which in this case is the uh, NOT card. NOC 77101 card. Okay. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, um, this is the way it looks after it's been configured, and that we configure these devices and they show up, and then the data information is shown up on the configuration. And then we go to the individual devices, and we can see, in this case, what uh, Schneider calls the connection information. This connection information inside the PLC defines the size of the implicit message. So in this case, for the Schneider Elector, it consists of bytes. Um, with Rockwell, they talk about words. But um, in this case, we're talking about the number of bytes in the device that it will give to the owning, um, the owner, the owning scanner. So the one thing that uh, is, is real critical when we're setting this up and that you have to understand is this idea of what objects we're going to look at. So in this case, we have a set of connections that are predefined. And basically, what that's doing is pointing to the objects inside of the, inside of the altimeter um, for communicating with. And then that sets up our default communication parameters. So we'll change this. Okay. And we'll take a look at it. And so you can see, since we changed the connection type, we've changed the size of data and the amount of data that we're communicating between the two devices. Cancel on that. And one of the uh, important features for uh, on, on the uh, Schneider Electric side, on the quantum, not card, is uh, the diagnosis feature. So in this case, we can take a look at our connection. And if we're having a bad connection with some device, so let's say, for example, the power flex, we can select it in our quick scan tree, and it gives us a description of what the error is. And if there's any problems with the drive, um, and the communications. So this is a, a pretty important piece of equipment. Um, it's very nice to have. And the other nice thing about the, uh, the, the, the Schneider is, is that if you uh, don't know everything that's on your drive, you can do a field bus discovery of the device. When you find it, um, you will add it to the um, Add it to the I.O. tree, to the, the, the I.O. list. And when you add these devices that it's found, so for example, let's say we find a, another Altair.
it will um, create, and once we set it, once we've established this connection, it will create the tags within the PLC program automatically. And those tags, once they're created, um, begin communicating just natively. So the data that we want to get out of here will start coming in as soon as we've discovered it on the network and taken ownership of it. It comes in this predefined uh, uh, array size, and then the data just is populated automatically. So that makes the, the uh, connection and the control of the device uh, somewhat, somewhat easy and uh, quick to understand. The critical piece of information that you have to understand though when you're doing this is what is what are these attributes, what are the size of them, and what format they're in so that you can communicate and connect to it. If you get that wrong, um, it has a lot of problems connecting and, and communicating. So that's the, really the key piece of information for, for Ethernet IP is understanding that object structure and the, the class codes for those objects so that you can get that information. Come back over here to the rock wall. On the rock wall side, we do use a slightly different methodology. Unless what we're going to do here is we're going to unplug the network and we're going to break the connection between the Schneider and the power plants. What you'll see is on the I.O. tree, uh, we have the PowerPlex uh, device was uh, showing bad communication, and now it's going to reestablish communication with the with control boxes. But what we'll see is we'll see the power button now is, is showing, will show us good because we are now the control logic is the only processor. And Now's a good time to stop anyway. I'm going to start it now. Hang on. Ready? Okay, so now we've reestablished communication with the control logics. And what we're going to show is, is how we configure uh, devices on with, with the control logic software with, with rocks. Basically, we go to the IO configuration tree. And if we have a pre-existing device that we can select, we can select it. So in this case, in this case, we'll have to be offline. We want to add a drive. Start this one. 
idiot, that's why. I'm gonna put that in there. Let's go back, let's go back to the very beginning. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so now we've reconnected the, the control logics uh, network, and that right now we're owning the PowerFlex with the uh, control logics. And what we'll do is we'll give you guys a, a demonstration of how you, would con uh, how you would configure a control logics module. First off, what you do is you go to the, uh, under the IO configuration to the Ethernet module, and you select a new module. And then inside of there, you'll have a list of the different types of of items that you can connect to. So in this case, we would have selected a, a PowerFlex drive, and we'll go to the one that we've already established. And we'll open that up, and in here, you can see that we would enter the IP address, um, whatever connection information uh, we would need to uh, set up in terms of the, uh, of the scan rate of the device. But the most important uh, item that you configure with, uh, with, the, with the Rockwell software is in the PLC, we have these um, input data and output data selection uh, of checkboxes. This is what defines what values you want to see in your implicit message. So these two arrays, uh, with, respect to the, the, um, with respect to the PLC, uh, which is, is output is output from the PLC and input is input to the PLC. Um, what information we want to send to it and what information we want to read from that drive. Once we've selected that in the PLC program, we then come over to the drive, we then connect to the drive. In this case, we've already got it selected. And then we would have options to upload or download the parameters. Since we already have parameters in here, uh, and we have we, we've changed them, we could we could uh, 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 download new parameters into the drive or upload the existing parameters. Uh, we don't want to do that in this case because we're communicating. So uh, we have. We would have a predefined, once again, a predefined set of uh, data attributes coming from the object. And then once we've downloaded this into the drive, and once we've set this up on the PLC, we can come back in here and we can see that we have inside of our tags. a set of instructions that are already predefined and we have uh, uh, objects and then we have inside of a PLC we have objects with attributes or uh, tag names that um, correspond to the functionality of the device. So this, this set of tags that now exists in the PLC is created when we add the device to the I.O. tree and since it's implicitly messaging we've got a constant connection we're always communicating once we have ownership of that drive. So, two different models. Um, in this model, we use the PLC program to um, configure the, the parameters that we want to see. In here, we get the parameters from the device, but then once we've gotten the parameters, we can connect to the device via the web page, go to the Ethernet IP scanner, set up, and then we can change what data types, once we log in, we can change what data types we want to see from the controller online. So um, even though with, with the quantum, uh, you have to already have a predefined address and it, the tags that it creates are, are just generic tags, um, we can go into the Altivar drive and online make changes to the configuration. As opposed to with the control logics, you preset the uh, 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 
tags that you want to see, you put it into the PLC program, the PLC program then downloads that parameters to the drive, and you can't change those without doing a download to the PLC because it doesn't change the fields um, because those fields are all predefined. So two different approaches, uh, uh, both of them have their strengths and um, it's just a question of preferences and um, uh, that's basically how you would set up implicit communications for the two different controllers. Um, and now we'll take a, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pause for just a second and we'll start the next demonstration um, and we'll talk about explicit messaging uh, fairly quickly. Go ahead. Okay, we're uh, back with the ISA uh, uh, Las Vegas section uh, presentation on taking Ethernet IP to the platform. Uh, this section we're going to uh, cover explicit messaging and uh, go through the advantages and disadvantages and the takeaways for the plant and we're going to show some network troubleshooting tools and all that. So first off, what we'd like to do is give a, a very simple example, uh, not very practical, but it's a uh, an example that's going to demonstrate uh, when we talk about required objects for the Ethernet device. So we're going to go into the quantum, into the, uh, the quantum unity program, and we're going to go to our Ethernet IP uh, car, and we're going to set up a very simple explicit message, which is a basically a read of uh, a value and we're going to go to uh, object, uh, object number one with a class code of one, the first instance in the first half here. <coughs> so what we're seeing here is, and this is just a, a tool that the quantum card has um, that allows you to set up a, 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 a explicit message via, via Ethernet IP. And we've gone out to the Control Logics PLC, and we're getting back to the vendor identification code. Now then, we can change this IP address to another device. For example, let's check with the Altavir drive. And we get the response from the Altavir drive. This is a very nice tool because you can set it up, you can test your communications, uh, your explicit messaging uh, structure, and uh, get responses, and it gives you your error code right here. Um, so this is very useful for setting up your original explicit messaging. But you also notice here that we have a different code because we're going to the Altair drive, so we have a different ma manufacturer vendor ID. Now, if we come over to the Control Logics PLC, what we've done is we've set up a message command, a standard uh, Control Logics message command. And inside of it, we've set up a uh, generic CIP read, uh, get attribute symbol. Set, this is the exact same, this is the exact same message uh, that we had over there at the Shiner, but just within the Rockwell configuration. And you can see that we're communicating the uh, to class one, instance one, attribute one, and we're writing it to the plant PLC two, uh, plant, plant zero one PLC reading value, and we're getting a value back here uh, from the PLC, and we're successfully communicating. Um, so, what we've shown here is, is when we talk about the objects and the instances and attributes in the previous uh, the, uh, previous presentations, what we use that for is setting up this message. And having this knowledge of what, uh, what the uh, codes are uh, is, is required for setting up the communication. So one of the things that we want to demonstrate here is, is uh, uh, what are some of the tools that we have for troubleshooting the network. Because Ethernet IP uh, does live on the Ethernet. And uh, we do need some tools for troubleshooting what's going on on the network. Uh, one of the things you can see is a third-party software. Um, third-party software, there are many uh, uh, networking tools that exist out here. Here's one piece that has a web interface. 
um, or a browser interface, and uh, we can do some predefined checks on the network, and then in, in Stata we can go to that, that browser page and, and just have a general idea of how, how things are doing. The other thing uh, that we have is, is as we've shown, uh, each one of these devices has its own browser page, and in the browser page, we can go to it, and in this case, these are the Hershman switches. And inside these Hershman switches, there's a, a lot of information about not only uh, uh, the, uh, or a lot of information and tools, there's a lot of information about the switch, but there's also tools um, that you can use to help see what's going on, in particular, like your systems law, your events law, um, IP address, conflict detection. All of these things can help you determine what's going on with your network if you're having problems. And then, depending on your requirements, uh, you could have uh, Ethernet vendors uh, uh, provide their own uh, diagnostic software. In this case, this is the Hirschman Industrial High Vision software. And it shows what the status is of uh, your network in a, a, a kind of a, a graphical interface. And so what we'll do is we'll come over to the network and we'll just connect a, a, a switch. We'll simulate a port failure or, or a, a, a break in the, in the cable. And what you'll see is this will update on the uh, graphical interface and generate a new alarm showing that we're now disconnected between these two switches. And so it's a little bit intuitive is that we can see, oh, here's the problem. Let's go out and see where we're at. Let's go replace our cable or fix our switch. And then we'll wait for it to show back up. Now, what we've done in this case is we've We've set up a, 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 a ring style network in this area between the three Hirschman switches so that if this connection was broken, we still had communication via an alternative path. And uh, that goes back to our best practices and, and other things that we do within the network. Um, one of the other tools that we can use, and this is specific to uh, Hirschman and Rockwell, but we can set up a uh, explicit communication between the uh, uh, switch and the PLC that's looking for any trouble statuses. And we'll go back. And you'll see that the PLC has detected from its in the Ethernet IP communications to the switch that we have an alarm. And we can generate an alarm within the PLC um, to do something within the PLC or for it to be sent up to our state application. And in this case, we could have a flashing light or an alarm on our system showing that we've lost the network or that there's problems on the network. So, what we've talked about is it's the basics of Ethernet IP. We've talked about how to implement uh, different devices from different manufacturers. And we've talked about uh, the different tools that, it, that you can have as an industrial Ethernet user um, um, to diagnose your Ethernet network. Um, what are the things that are important to an end user is, is this. Ethernet IP runs on, first off, the Ethernet IP runs on an Ethernet network. And there's a, a substantial knowledge base of Ethernet and Ethernet networking that can be used um, to uh, assist you on the plant floor. Secondly, it opens up a good deal of data from the devices themselves that um, would be uh, a little cost prohibitive to implement on a traditional 4 to 20 discrete wiring network between the PLC and the devices. Um, it also obviously allows you some flexibility. You may want to change what you want to see in the future 
And you can do that either by downloading the program or changing it inside of the, inside of the device itself. And finally, um, there's a lot of tools and information out there for Ethernet IP and the network, and a lot of a knowledge base, in particular uh, with CIP, um, that already exists. Um, and it's not something that, that people don't know. There's a lot of, of tribal knowledge that's out there on these devices. So those are some of the things why Ethernet IP is, is a viable uh, communication protocol on the, on the plant floor. One of the things that we'd like to do as part of this presentation is uh, generate some references. Um, in particular, um, we've got the ODBA. Uh, the ODBA has a lot of excellent resources in it about Ethernet IP and um, Ethernet uh, networking and best practices. Um, the Industrial Ethernet Book web page um, is uh, 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 geared towards industrial Ethernet in general, but it has a very good section on Ethernet IP. But if you're interested in different types of uh, Ethernet protocols uh, to be used in the industry, it has a lot of that. It has a lot of uh, good references for the uh, Schneider equipment. Rockwell Automation has a, a uh, tremendous amount of resources on the web about Ethernet IP. And um, also, um, if you search the web for Ethernet IP, you'll probably see John Rinaldi and, and Real-Time Automation come up. Um, he's put a lot of very good resources out there, a lot of summaries and information, and uh, we, we borrow from some of his stuff uh, for this presentation. And then for the ISA uh, Las Vegas chapter, uh, we'd like to do some special thanks to the City of Las Vegas for helping us out with uh, providing uh, PLCs and equipment for the presentation. Uh, ATI here in Las Vegas and Schneider Electric for uh, the equipment for the drives, and Grove Matson and Rockwell Automation for the power cups and the control logics, and the Hirschman uh, representative of Las Vegas, he helped us out by giving us the uh, switches. So um, thank you to everyone. Thank you for everyone for watching, and uh, hopefully we've uh, provided you some more information about Ethernet IP uh, that you can use uh, at your plant or in your office. Thank you very much.